Fuller Theological Seminary forms leaders who are called to serve a changing church and world. We frequently host events that offer insight and inspire conversation on topics of interest to the global church. Welcome to the conversation. Sister Mary Mott is our first speaker this morning of the Franciscan Missionaries of Mary with a PhD from Boston College just a few years ago. My wife and I met Sister Mary in Jamaica, of all places, a few years ago at a World Council of Churches um, the missionary uh, event, Commission on Mission Evangelism, a uh, set of organizations. Reflecting on the fact that uh, one of the questions that Steve Bevins, as he reflected on yesterday, about uh, needing to continue thinking in terms of evangelical Pentecost influences on Catholicism and its missionary thrusts about the role of women. We've had Sister Mary being at the forefront of women as uh, Catholic missionaries and contributing to Catholic mission theology over the last few years. And so we're very thrilled to have her with us. I didn't ask her any personal questions to introduce her, but I found a wonderful nugget this morning. Having, my wife and I were having lunch, uh, breakfast out there. And we uh, had breakfast with a couple, the wife who had just finished her doctor of missiology here at Fuller Theological Seminary. And she said this, that if I had not gotten married, I would have become a Roman Catholic missionary just like Mary Mott. <laughs> and her husband was quite glad that she had gotten married. <laughs> but that itself says a lot to us about Mary's work and its importance for us in thinking about innovations past and future. Our respondent is Juan F. Martinez, who is the Vice President for Diversity and International Ministries here at Fuller Theological Seminary, as well as Professor of Hispanic Studies and Pastoral Leadership in the School of Theology. That's a long title. He's the author of many books, including Los Protestantes, an Introduction to Latino Protestantism in the United States, and Walk with the People, Latino Ministry in the United States. Mary Mott's paper is The Challenging Emergence of New Paths, the Future of Mission in Roman Catholicism. Thank you. I'm very humbled and grateful to be here. And I have discovered in my time here that this is really a grace that has come through all of you. So thank you. I will speak this morning on the emergence of new paths. Uh, as Amos just said, I'm going to treat this in four sections. An introduction, uh, and looking at that as a beginning, uh, a beginning point from the context that the end is where we start from. Uh, and I will look at the call to, uh, we experience, the, the context we're living in, the call that we experience as missionaries, and the, um, the sources. And then I will look a little bit at the vision emerging from Vatican II. I can't do this in great detail. It will be missing many parts, and many of you will recognize what those parts are but it will at least give us an overview. And then I will look at the image of, I will look at this from the image of a mess and the Holy Spirit and the, uh, some orientations from Vatican II. Then going towards a new creation, a new understanding of mission, bending low in washing others' feet, um, the missionary vocation from a lowly place, universality in the missionary vocation, and the washing the feet of the other. And finally, a conclusion, uh, taking a text from the joy of the gospel on raised ground, um, life breaks through. On the raised land, right, life breaks through. And we can look at the um, Kairos moment that we're in and the, as the context of that and the gospel as the wellspring of what we are drawing our sources from. And that's all of us. It's not just from a Catholic perspective, but I will be looking mainly at the Catholic perspective because the journey in mission, you had begun it, most of you had begun it long before we did as Catholics. So uh, we did in some ways begin it. I don't want to say it was a blank slate. So the beginning point, the end is where we start from. That's a quote from Little, uh, Little Gidding of T.S. Eliot. And as we look at that, the world situation... Um, I've got to remember to do this, too. Is this... Is this? Oh. Okay. Get up. There. The, uh, 
the all endings are new beginnings. Before speaking about the emergence of new paths and the future of mission in Roman Catholicism, I wish to consider the insight of Ewart Cousins, who is a professor of religious uh, studies at Fordham University, which he said shortly before his death about six years ago. He grasped a profound urgency in the world today where everywhere people are undergoing, and this is a quote from him, undergoing the most radical, far-reaching, and challenging transformation in history. The very survival of life on the planet is situated between chaos and destruction or creative transformation and a birth of new consciousness of the other. Today, we confront terrible suffering, excruciating experiences of migration, natural disasters, broken relationships, hunger, illness of epidemic proportions, the Ebola crisis, among others, death. And the missionary call in the context of this is spurred on by the face of human suffering and struggle. Missionaries are called to move beyond boundaries. The interaction of human suffering, scientific discoveries about the universe, and theological discernment about God's work in creation can lead more deeply into the mystery of God through contemplation of the Trinity, creating, loving, and transforming. A theology that takes evolution seriously, Dennis Edwards tells us, is found in a Trinitarian vision of God as a God of mutual relations, a God who is communion and love, a God who is friendship beyond all comprehension. Some of the sources of shifts in Catholic mission. The council provoked new ways of thinking, seeing and engaging in mission. This journey since Vatican II has been accompanied ecumenically by related developments in missiology among evangelical and conciliar Christians. And I think you will see much of that as we go through this. I won't stop each time, though. In this line, we experience a coincidence of grace in this gathering through the celebration of a jubilee year of the School of Intercultural, um, Intercultural Studies and the 50th year since the conclusion of Vatican II, and there's many other 50th anniversaries, and its opening for the Roman Catholic Church to engage in ecumenical relations. That is the beginning in a very big way for those of us who are Catholics. The Spirit of God has gifted all of us with a de deepening collaboration and spirituality and our discernment of a new vision of mission. The following words capture something of how this vision, rooted in the mystery of the incarnation, might be experienced. And again, quoting from T.S. Eliot, we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. A new vision that comes out of the work of Vatican II, and I have borrowed from Pope Francis in, saying, in looking at the question of a mess uh, giving birth to transformation. The image of a mess Pope Francis often uses as the image of mess. You've probably read it if you've read some of his comments uh, in visiting. To describe the situation through which the church draws closer to the lives of the people. For Francis, a mess gives one a free heart and makes solidarity and hope possible. These images, a free heart, and solidarity and hope suggest the Holy Spirit is actively involved in the inner dynamics of mess. 
And if we look at a mess and can see and can see the interactive energy of the Holy Spirit, then we are able to see in a new way. Also, often in the encounter between two points of view, and I think many of us have experienced that, in the messiness of an argument, and perhaps the anger we feel at times, the Holy Spirit indeed is stirring up something new. Theologizing the concept of a mess, we can reread our experiences and recognize the mysterious, strange wisdom of the Holy Spirit at work in the heart of conflict. And I think those of us that came through Vatican II and post-Vatican II, etc., and continue um, within the Catholic tradition, we certainly have experienced a lot of messes. We can see the newness into which God is calling us. As it says in the book of Revelation, Behold, I make all things new. What are some of the orientations of Vatican II affecting mission? And I tell you, these are not all of them. It's just some of them. And some of them read from the particular view that I brought as I was preparing this text. The work of the council over four years deeply disturbed the construct submission uh, for many Roman Catholics. And eventually, this disturbance has opened for them, for us, to, uh, to, has opened us to new possibilities. And the, uh, you know that in, in, among Roman Catholics, it's not so true today, but among Roman Catholics 50 years ago, the main people who were missionaries were the members of religious orders. Uh, one of the first things that comes out of Vatican II is a pastoral approach. That was very different in the, in the Roman Catholic tradition. John XXIII had called for a pastoral approach. At the beginning of the Second Vatican Council, October 11, 1962, he spoke of a new moment in history that would lead to a new order of human relations. The pastoral approach to the documents of the Council is reflected in the communal language used. And I, I owe a great debt to the people who have researched this, particularly uh, John O'Malley, uh, Jesuit, uh, who has done a lot on the council, but I'm not putting all the footnotes in here. They're in the paper. Uh, if, for example, the language of brothers and sisters is used in the documents. A language, the language that's more participatory, the language expressing collaboration, subsidiarity, you know, you allow what, what can be done at one level to be done at that level and not to control it from a higher level. Participation. Another uh, aspect that comes is the relationships with other Christians and other religions. The growing recognition of the relation between ecumenism and mission. The importance of human relationships. Development of inductive approaches to dialogue which slowly and painfully are shaping a way forward. De uh, interfaith dialogue has been the most, most challenging, and many people have suffered deeply uh, because of their courage to move forward in that area within the Roman Catholic tradition. A dialogue of life has evolved in many places in Asia. Missionaries choose to live among neighbors of other faiths, meeting with them around daily tasks. Very often the women do this, but the men do it too, uh, to, to some extent. Uh, for instance, washing their clothes in the river, or etc. Sharing in conversation, and as appropriate, in prayer. In Algeria and Libya, the Muslim neighbors of our Franciscan Missionary of Mary sisters begged them, begged them to stay during a very dangerous situation when many were being killed. After discernment and prayer, the sisters chose to remain. From this experience, a new orientation and mission has emerged among us, fidelity to the people to whom we are sent. It's a very similar to the prophetic dialogue that Steve mentioned uh, yesterday. This way of seeing fidelity has led to a more dynamic understanding of being a missionary disciple, 
communicating the good news of Jesus by walking in solidarity with the people. Another um, thrust that has come out of Vatican II, the renewal of the liturgy, and Steve mentioned that yesterday, the prayer of the church, the centrality of the paschal mystery, that is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Divine revelation becomes centered on the word of God incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth. You know that the Catholics were very weak in the study of scripture, particularly the Old Testament. The council's decrees on the missionary activity of the church, religious freedom, and, and on the church in the modern world led missionary congregations to examine their mission theology and practice. The and agentes, the missionary activity, the council affirms that the church was sent to reveal and communicate the love of God to all people and recognizes that a tremendous missionary work still needs to be done. Following the council's recognition in Dignitatis Humanae, the religious freedom of the importance of the search for truth and each person's responsibility in conscience to adhere to the truth once discovered and the need to understand more profoundly how the gospel is communicated and received. In Perfecte Caritatis, that was the council's uh, decree on religious life, the council asked congregations of women and men to return to their sources and identify their founding charism as expressed and practiced by their foundresses or founders. Careful and patient work led members to new ways of seeing and identification of different creative challenges in the context of today. I just want to say, this work, work has taken many years and continues. The council grasped the necessity of taking into account the joy and hope, the grief and anguish of the people, the call to enter into the lives of our sisters and brothers, which is expressed in the final document, Gaudium et Spes. Signposts for the future of mission are embedded in the work of Vatican II, of which I mention only a few. These signposts have already set in motion a profound shift towards transformation into missionary disciples. And we're saying this now 50 years after the council. It has taken and is not finished yet. Following Vatican II, missionary congregations delved into a long and agonizing searches for how concretely to realize the call in their ministries. Luke 4, 16, 30, I have come to bring good news to the poor, is a text which inspired the thinking of many Catholic missionaries after Vatican II. It was kind of like a mantra, and we kept trying to understand how, what it meant for us. The renewal inaugurated by Vatican II results in recognizing a missionary as a person who is rooted in an engagement with the people, especially the poor. The mess experienced in these searches and arguments finally yielded a deep experience of God's spirit. Oppositions came together in new ways, and this search continues now into the future. The inspirational vision of the council finds its source in the apostolic faith expressed in the gospel and first Christian communities. And that was before any divisions in the church. Now, 50 years after Vatican II, we are experiencing a new depth of renewal. As Jacques Dupuy, SJ, who was a great scholar and a great um, visionary and a great person in terms of in really researching interfaith uh, relationships and dialogue, wrote, like all councils in the life of the church, Vatican II does not resemble, represent a last word, but rather a first word. It points in the direction to which to walk in order to reach a broader understanding of God's design for humankind, which will always remain beyond our complete comprehension. 
toward a new creation. And that new creation in mission, bending low and washing the feet of the other. A missionary vocation is from a lowly place. Pope Francis told the new cardinals that he created in February 2015, the gospel of the marginalized is where our credibility as it at, is at stake is discovered and is revealed. Through this image and continued repeated expression by word and deed, Francis offers an incisive image of church which is rooted in apostolic experience directed toward a profound transformation of present practice and expressed in the poorest, the marginalized peoples of the world. The universality of the missionary vocation, uh, Roman for, well, it's all of us, but looking at Roman Catholics now, it's no longer just the missionary congregations. It includes everyone, all those who are baptized, laity, religious orders of missionaries, men and women, each with their own specificity. I'm not saying a lot about women per se in this paper because that would be another topic, um, but I, I fully adhere to women needing a greater role in the church, but it's not exactly the point here. The universality of the missionary vocation affirmed by Vatican II, we are all missionaries by our baptism. And you know, baptism in the common, in the, um, the unity documents that we have produced back in the 80s, baptism is something shared across our different traditions. It is a, a vital component of a transformed living of mission. Being aware of that is a vital component of a transformed living of mission today. Catholic laity have become increasingly involved in mission since Vatican II. These groups of laymen and women, married or single, are approved by the Holy See as associations of the faithful for the purpose of evangelization. They are sent as missionaries to proclaim the gospel in their countries of origin or other countries. Washing the feet of the other. The renewal initiated by Vatican II has led to building just, respectful relationships with others based on the conviction that everyone, everyone is loved by God. We are, co we pray, to, we, excuse me, we are called to work in solidarity with those who suffer. This vision continues to lead men and women, religious, lay and lay, laity, to walk in the journey of another people. The future of mission is emerging from new way of seeing, which requires starting from being with the people, openness to discover how God is acting in their lives, discerning together with them the truth and presence of God's love, discerning with them how it's happening in their lives, and moving forward to encounter the future. Relationships are understood, are understood as new ways of loving one another, new ways of seeing, new understandings of diversity, new insights into solidarity, and this describes a missionary disciple. A missionary disciple holds ongoing contemplation of the mystery of God, the trinity of love, as a continual reference. And finally, the conclusion and again borrowing from the joy of the gospel, on raised land, life breaks through. Signpost, it's a time of kairos, and I think we've heard that a lot here, but I think that's a very powerful image for us at this point. Signposts from the council pointing to the new into which God calls us are always being confirmed. And at this moment, we seem to be at a critical juncture of something new. We experience the grace of living in a kairos moment, a time when conditions are right for the accomplishment of a crucial action, the opportune and decisive moment. And for many of us, it's the full realization, the full reception of Vatican II. It would seem that Pope Francis has been called to lead the church 
into this new moment of a fuller realization of Vatican II. In the joy of the gospel, he says, we will know the missionary joy of sharing life with God's faithful people as we strive to light a fire in the heart of the world. Our role as missionary disciples moved beyond barriers to embrace the challenging transformations of our history. We cannot shut off history. We cannot shut off the challenges that come to us and and stick to conformity to the past. We have to move ahead in the grace and light of God's wisdom. We need to discern, to continue discerning how God is leading. This discernment has experienced the richness of ecumenical challenge and collaboration. And that what we have achieved together calls us to continue now into the future. The context of the kairos that we're living, the context energizing this moment is the survival of our planet, which is situated between chaos and destruction on one hand, or creative transformation and the birth of a new consciousness of the other on the other hand. As we seek to understand how all this will shape the future of mission, the affirmation arises before us and within us, that the return to the wellspring of the gospel is the way into the future. It is a revolution of mercy. Thank you, Dr. Mott. I am one of those Latino or Latin American uh, evangelicals who's been impacted by Papa Francisco. I can't call him Pope Francis, doesn't sound right. Uh, He is inviting Catholics to rethink what it means to be the people of God in the world. Many of us on the outside are also listening because he sounds an awful lot like an Anabaptist Pentecostal, and those are the two influences on my life. Uh, And so we are in anticipation of what will happen in the Catholic Church and how it will affect the rest of us. As we reflect on how Catholics and evangelicals think about the missiology missiology in the future, I'd like to ask some questions to advance what I heard um, uh, this morning, what I read uh, through the documents. So in, in, through five types of questions, I, I just want to invite us to think about how we advance what we have heard. First of all, ecumenical mission. What does ecumenical-oriented mission mean when our theologies are so different? If we cannot share the communion table and cannot agree on what it means to be church, how do we do mission together? I find it interesting that for many of my Pentecostal and charismatic colleagues, they feel really comfortable with Francisco because he prays for the sick and people get healed. And that scares a lot of Westerners. But I would like to argue that maybe there's a place to start. That maybe it is in the recognition that we really do believe in the Spirit of God and that we really do believe that in praying for others, the Spirit of God works. Second area of question. What does it mean to minister in our context? When does context and human learning define our mission? And when do we need to challenge our context and its assumptions about human life? And I think we, we need to ask the question. I think Francisco, and again, I, I keep coming back to Francisco as a, as, as a touch point, just in his life and his way of doing ministry, really does challenge us to think about when is Western learning reality? And when is it just a way of looking at the world? Uh, in, to put it in, in other kinds of terms, how do we speak to Stephen Hawking? Third type of question, briefly. The gospel and our mission. How does the gospel inform mission today? Which parts of the gospel, a reference to Luke 4, which has become very popular amongst many of us, uh, how does the Great Commission inform our, our sense of the gospel. How does, again, spiritual power 
inform our sense of the gospel? Uh, again, I, I keep remembering, I remember a scene from a uh, little bit when Francisco is praying for the sick. And, and you may have seen it because it, it went around the world, the video. And apparently there's some kind of movement and, and, and people are saying, those of us who are from outside, boy, there's been a powerful movement of the spirit, maybe even exorcism. And then Westerners are trying to explain, no, that really isn't what it was. Don't, don't get scared. You know, Francisco isn't really messing our categories that much. Well, he really was. And maybe that one of the places where the gospel should speak to our mission today is the gospel of spiritual power. I, again, I find it interesting that the only people that had problems with what Francisco were doing was modern Westerners. Fourth area of question. How do we believe into God's future? How does eschaton inform our mission today? What do we believe about God's future? And again, we throw out words like kairos and we throw it out pretty liberally. But what do we mean when we say that we believe that this is God's time? And how does our sense of what God is at work doing, what does it tell us? What is the eschaton? How does our confession of the future frame our actions today? My parents worked, um, uh, I was a migrant worker or the child of migrant workers. My parents later, when they were converted, became pastors amongst migrant workers. And one of the things I heard once I went to seminaries was how escapists migrant workers were, because we kept singing songs about the second coming of Jesus. And they were all about the future. And for a while, I drank at that well until I realized that if you work 16 hours a day, seven days a week, and that's your future, you better believe in God's eschaton and God's tell us. The poor may sound escapist to us Westerners who have it all too well. But the hope for divine intervention, the prayer for Christ's return, is because they really do believe in a God who intervenes. And again, I point to Francisco who reminded those who here in the United States have lost sight of the immigrants and the undocumented amongst us that he is a child of immigrants. And that he too draws on the experience of migration on needing to believe in the future. Fifth area and final for me. How do we do mission in the midst of ambiguity in our life and ministry? What are the places of connection between Christian churches and now, again, coming back to the ecumenical theme, when we live in the midst of ambiguity? Clearly, we are in a mess. And I, I love that word. I mean, that's, 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 where, that's, where, that's where I do my work. That's where I do my ministry. It's in the ambiguity and the mess. Uh, some of you know here from Fuller that when uh, the provost invited me into the first iteration, he changes my, my job every year or so. Um, <laughs> since I start working for the provost, it changes about once a year. Um, my, my newest title is, is uh, 22 days old, 23 days old. So just so that you know, it does happen. This is, this is the reality. Uh, when he described what he wanted me to do here at Fuller, he says, okay, now I understand. You want me to be associate provost for ambiguity, <laughs> for messiness. We are in a mess. The categories that guided us don't work. And those of us who you know, have been here Long enough, I'm also a SWIM graduate, uh, SIS graduate, and as I tell people, I never met David Allen Hubbard when I was a student here, but I did shake Donald McGovern's hand. And so I, I got the categories right. <laughs> I, uh, I did shake the hand of the saint. But the categories don't work anymore. So... What is the gospel that we, that we proclaim together in, in this mess? In this messiness? 
for the categories that guided our two traditions in this moment that we're talking about, how do we proclaim good news together? And again, I think Dr. Mott pointed us to those to places and, again, uh, Francisco's model. Uh, how do we bend and wash the feet of the other? How do we do that with a free heart? How do we, how do we live into that reality? What does it mean from that perspective, from bending over and washing the feet of the other? What does it mean to pray for the sick? What does it mean to work for justice? What does it mean to do that in the name of Jesus Christ? And what does that mean to invite other people to faith in that same Jesus Christ? Dr. Mott, you've stirred up a lot of my thinking. I am very grateful for that. And yes, um, even those of us who are evangelicos, uh, if we're going to claim a Catholic saint, it's probably going to be Francisco. So thank you very much for your invitation to have us reimagine. Thank you. All right. Um, there's just so much, and uh, we have gone from Francis, the Pentecostals, to exorcisms, to cosmology, to chirology, to messology. <laughs> Mary, we need to give you a minute, a second to respond, or a few minutes to respond to that in terms of the future is, is not just of Catholic missiology or of Pentecostal missiology. I mean, Pentecostals don't even think about cosmology. <laughs> right? They, Pentecostals don't even think. Um, oh. <laughs> they do, they do. I can say that, right? <laughs> but the categories are, are being blurred, right? And, uh, and, and we need to think about, yeah, exorcisms and church growth and science and the environment. Talk to us for a few minutes in light of Juan's questions. All five of them. First of all, I want to thank you and I want to thank Juan. Uh, what a beautiful... Well, you did this so much better than I did. You had it so <laughs> down, so concrete. Thank you. I, I would just say, yes, I think cosmology is very important. I think the, the universe, the expanding universe, the unfinished creation, uh, I think we have to take this more into consideration. I could didn't expand on it there. I think that's where the Trinity, uh, the, 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 and we can't understand the Trinity, but the images we can as we deepen into that, that partaking of God, as, as Dennis Edwards calls it, and it goes back to the fathers of the church, or fathers, I, there were no mothers, but there must have been, but the, 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 ones, the ones that were known. <laughs> Like, like Basil of Cesarea and Athanasius uh, and others. But, but to know that that, is, that, predates, that predates our Reformation, et cetera. But, so I think that is important. We need to explore it. I'm not an expert. I, I would not say the Pentecostals don't do that. I think that the Pentecostals in particular have looked to the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit is the opening, if you will, in the Trinity of God that calls us into that future. And we can't separate the Trinity, I, I know. But you know, you know what I'm saying? We, the, the Spirit is kind of in many ways forgotten. Some of us as, as women, we speak of the Spirit in feminine terms because the actions of the Spirit can be feminine. But that's, and so that, and that, you know, that's something that challenges many of us because we've always used the word he to describe, and still do. <laughs> um, so I think that, that these are there, but I think the... You know, things like healings and things, uh, I haven't gotten in much into that. Many of our African uh, sisters and brothers within both, all the traditions have been more into that and, and also in Latin America, uh, Pope Francis. I, I think there's many things that we can deepen our understandings of, but I think it all comes about because we can bend low and we can wash the feet of others. And I think that's something new. We don't have the answers. That's something new for all of us in the missionary uh, journey, as missionary disciples. 
I don't know if that answers your Amen question. to that. I think that, you know, as from an evangelical Pentecostal perspective, we, of course, our first instincts go back to Scripture. But in the process of doing that, we've forgotten the 2,000 years of resources and both right and wrong turns that have been made that we can actually learn from in terms of thinking about how to engage even the next 5 or 10 or 15 or yeah. 20 years as we want to look toward the future. So thank you very much again, Mary, for, for that. Thank you. All right. We have a little bit of time for... Um, we, we have... A, Oh, I can go sit down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just a couple of announcements real quickly as we uh, look, look ahead here. Thank you very much. Fuller Theological Seminary offers a variety of graduate degree programs in theology, psychology, and intercultural studies at nine locations and online. Subscribe to us on iTunes to hear more or visit us.